Hey everybody, Antoni here, who has just turned 25 as of right now. And on top of that, I am also celebrating four years of being a YouTube reviewer. And to celebrate these two milestones, here's my review of Benjamin Britten's final opera, Death in Venice, which I saw at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. The conductor was Donald Runnicles. The production was done by Graham Vick. The sets and costumes were done by Stuart Nunn. The lighting was handled by Wolfgang Goebel. The choreographer was Ron Howell. The assistant director was Claudia Dott. The chorus masters were Ido Arad, Christopher White, and Raymond Hughes, and the dramaturgy was handled by Kurt A. Rösler. This review is also dedicated to my very, very good friend, James B. Faraci, aka The Last of the Americans. So James, if you were watching this, I hope you had a very, very happy birthday. I wish you a lot of joy, happiness, love, and luck in everything that you do. And I just wish you a lot of great things to come. And I also hope you enjoy my review. And for those of you who are interested in checking out James B. Faraci's blog, The Last of the Americans, then I'll post the link on the description box below. You will definitely not be disappointed. His blog posts are really, really cool with a great sense of being down to earth and quite funny. And he's just a very, very wonderful person in general. Going into my first experience with Death in Venice, I first caught this ever since I was about 15 years old and I was traveling to London with my father. And we watched this opera at the English National Opera where Ian Bostridge sang the role of Gustav von Aschenbach. What was so particularly special about this opera was that this was the last time Benjamin Britten collaborated with one of his favorite tenors slash longtime collaborators, Peter Pierce, who performed the very pivotal role of Gustav von Aschenbach. And accompanying him was John Shirley Quirk, who sang a lot of the bass baritone characters. The basic story of Death in Venice goes like this. This chronicles the final days of German writer Gustav von Aschenbach, where he takes a trip to Venice and all around Italy, and he encounters this young man by the name of Pajo. And the basic gist of the story is von Aschenbach's sort of homoerotic fascination with Tajo. And at the end of the opera, as Tajo is about to leave and travel by sea, von Aschenbach dies while slumping from his chair, trying to reach out to him. Now, during the course of the story, von Aschenbach meets a lot of really colorful characters, from some hotel manager to a gondolier to a strawberry seller and even has a lot of very strange things happening to him like having his baggage sail all the way to Como. But despite all of these elements, the major, major catalyst of the story definitely has to be the fascination and the relationship Gustav von Aschenbach has with this very fine and very agile young man in the form of Pajo. This opera was based on the novel written by Thomas Mann, known in German as Der Tod in Venedig. Now from what I heard from the lecture before the opera is that the opera's ending is quite different from how the novel ended, which I found really, really interesting. On top of that, there are also a lot of mythological references, like you also have the voice of Apollo beckoning the likes of von Aschenbach and Tajo, and there's also an Olympic scene where Tajo always comes out on top, and we even have Dionysus and Apollo fighting over von Aschenbach, which I found really, really interesting. Now, my thoughts on the production is that it seems quite interesting. What's quite interesting about the execution is that this is set in a green screen, which means that we as the viewers are sort of like filmmakers in terms of how the action moves along, where are the specific places, and it's just 
quite interesting to look at, though I would have loved to have a lot of concrete scenery. But I guess it's also to establish that the entire stage is basically a canvas for Gustav von Aschenbach to paint on, and in this case to write on. And what's so noticeable about the first half of the opera is that we see a huge picture of a slightly distorted image of Gustav von Aschenbach, and we also see huge flowers to his right. And I also really like the fact that the characters imagine what they're doing right now as if to say that we as the audience sort of have the power to interpret what they're doing and what type of images these people can come up with even though the set does seem rather sparse and it seems to be only backed up with green screen, a few props, and a spotlight. And the costumes do fit the time rather well, as in the 20th century. So overall, it was a very interesting concept as of having the green screen be like a canvas and almost like some unfinished work that Gustav von Aschenbach is about to write before he ends up kicking the bucket. And the costumes were also quite elegant. I especially love the costume that the bass baritone wears when he wears a black feather boa. And what's also noticeable is that it's not von Aschenbach that dies in this production, but rather Tadjo ends up being beaten up by his so-called friends and von Aschenbach mourns over his dead body. So overall, it was a very interesting execution of this particular opera, and the costumes were really, really decent all around. Now we get to the singers, starting off with Paul Nylon, who sang the very pivotal role of Gustav von Aschenbach. What you really need from this particular character is either a character tenor or a light lyric tenor. Though if you ask me, a light lyric tenor who specializes in a lot of Mozart roles, a lot of light bel canto roles, and even Baroque roles, seems to be a very great fit for singing Gustav von Aschenbach. He not only has to sing wonderfully, but he also has to act very, very well. He has to be a very convincing stage actor. And when you put a very beautiful tenor voice and you combine it with a lot of raw emotions, which von Aschenbach feels no matter what scene he appears in, then one can definitely tell that this is a role which seems to be quite the Mount Everest of tenor roles when it comes to Britain operas. Not only was Peter Pierce a very well-known interpreter of this pivotal role, but a lot of really great light lyric tenors have flocked to sing this very, very challenging, yet very rewarding character. We had the likes of Ian Bostridge, and just a lot of great Mozart, Baroque, light lyric, and maybe a lot of modern opera tenors who specialized in this extremely pivotal role. And Paul Nylon was a very convincing singing actor. I felt the weight of his quest to search for true artistry, true beauty, and true everything that he wants to discover. One can sense a lot of depth, a lot of really great facets in which he embodied so well, and he had a very fine voice. He knew how to really pace himself very, very well, and when he had to sing, in Forte, he sang it with everything he's got. I basically knew Paul Nylon as a Baroque tenor, and he's also very, very well known in singing a lot of the Mozart tenor roles of Camino, and even a lot of the light lyric tenor bel canto roles. And I definitely felt that this particular role proved to be one of his finest hours Ever. Then we go to the bass baritone roles of the old gondolier, the rascal, the traveler, the hotel manager, the master of the house, 
the leader of the street singers, and of course the voice of Dionysus, the one and only and extremely fabulous bass baritone, Seth Carrico. Much like his predecessor being the four villains of Offenbach's Le Comte of Mann, these roles not only appear once, not twice, but a grand total of seven times. And for those of you who love cartoons, think of the likes of Mr. Hollywood from Two Stupid Dogs and the Red Guy from Cow and Chicken. The same person, but someone who wears different costumes. And that's basically the challenge of singing all of these seven roles. One not only has to have a very great voice, which is penetrating and full, round and rich, and it also manages to sing some falsetto from time to time, yet also maintain that fullness of tone, but he also has to prove himself to be a very great actor. And what more can I say about Seth Carrico? His stage presence is very alluring. He had the mannerisms in which he was able to come off as smug, sneaky, charming, and he managed to throw himself very, very well into each of these characters, all thanks to his luscious bass baritone voice. He had the mannerisms, he had a lot of great moments on stage, and he was just a very fine stage animal. He was able to give all of these roles a great amount of life, and he was just completely enjoyable from beginning to end. He was able to match Paul Nylon's Weight of the World, and then when you have someone like Seth Carrico, who complements Paul Nylon's world weariness so well with Carrico's charm, humor, and devil-may-care attitude, then you definitely have a very great chemistry with two wonderful singers. Then we also have Tai One, who sang the role of Apollo. And what you need from this role is a fine countertenor, who manages to sing his lines very, very well, but also has to be a fine actor. And luckily for someone like Mr. Tai One, he was wonderful as a singing actor. I was able to be so immersed in his particular rendition of the sun god Apollo and he was just extremely alluring to watch on stage. I love the vivacity that he has. I love how he manages to find a lot of nuances and I just love everything he does vocally and dramatically. So when you have these three pivotal roles when it comes to the singers, they all did magnificently. But what about the other pivotal role of Tajo? Well, that's what we have in the actor who portrayed Tajo, Rawant Taleb. Now what you need from Tajo is that you need a young man who is not only physically flexible as a dancer, but who can manage to bring a lot of charisma, a lot of charm, and a lot of boyishness to this particular character. And Rawan Taleb did a very amazing job embodying Tajo. He was able to make him very vivacious, very involving to witness on stage, and he was just a very fine dancer slash actor to witness. Equally fascinating was the very fine talent of Lena Natos, whose tall, elegant, and wonderful stage presence stroke me wonderfully as Tacho's mother. And she was able to move around the stage with grace and beauty. We also have such outstanding ensemble singing from the sopranos Alexandra Hutton, Catherine Manley, Michot Marrero, Lisa Mostyn, Joanna Foote, and Maya Lange, mezzo-sopranos Abigail Levis, Irene Roberts, Judith Kutasi, Alexandra Iones, Michelle Daly, and Jean Bruckhuizen, tenors Andrew Dickinson, James Krishik, Paul Kaufman, Gideon Popper, Attilio Glaser, and Matthew Pena, 
baritones Samuel Dale Johnson, Dong Juan Lee, John Carpenter, Philip Yekal, and Stephen Barkey, and of course, the very fine basso voice of Alexia Botnarschuk. So overall, the singing was absolutely star-studded all around, especially when it comes to all the dancers. It was a unified effort from everyone involved in this particular production, and a huge kudos has to go to Paul Nylon and Seth Carrico for really, really stealing the show and for showing a lot of endurance in the very pivotal roles of Gustav von Aschenbach and a lot of the bass baritone roles. And what more can one say about the conducting done by Donald Runnicles? It is just excellent, nuanced, and crisp all around. He led everyone in such an amazing way. So overall, what a way to celebrate my 25th birthday and my fourth year anniversary of being an online reviewer. And for those of you who caught this particular production of Death in Venice, what did you think of it? Did you love all the singers and especially the production? Was there a singer who stood out to you so much? Was there a dancer who stood out to you so much? Did you feel like everyone went together or did you feel like there were a few missteps here and there? Comment below and let me know. Well, that's all for now. I have to say that I am very blessed that I've made it to four years on being here on YouTube. And for someone who is now 25 years old, that is definitely something that is quite big for me because I feel like I have a lot to contribute in my life. I feel like I have a lot to do in my life in general, especially as a reviewer. And I just want to say thank you so much for keeping up with me for the past four years I've been reviewing. I want to thank my family, especially my mom and dad, for raising me well and for being there for me. I want to thank everyone who has been a major, major part of my life, from my fellow reviewers to my fellow bloggers, video bloggers, and all of my fellow actors, filmmakers, voice actors, what have you. I want to thank everyone who played a major, major part of my life. You guys are very, very awesome. And I want to thank all of my subscribers for just keeping up with me and everything that I do on YouTube. You guys are very, very awesome. I am so blessed to have you in my life, not only as a reviewer, but also as a person. And I wish you all the best. Well, that's all for my review of Benjamin Britten's Death in Venice. Stay tuned for more reviews. Keep on staying awesome. Keep on staying really, really great. And I just wish you all well. Take care, everybody.